and welcome to our Building Energy Code seminar series. The series is based on our National Energy Codes Conference, which is hosted annually by the U.S. Department of Energy. We're here to present you with the latest in building energy codes, from developments in the model codes to updates on what's happening across states and local governments, to highlighting tools and resources that you can take advantage of in your day-to-day -day practice. We'll be hearing from a number of leading experts about the challenges they're facing, ways they're working to solve them, and how their efforts are building the energy efficiency, comfort, quality, and affordability of America's homes and businesses. Join us virtually every week for important topics and interactive discussions and help us continue the conversation. To learn more, visit energycodes.gov. Laboratory, and I'd like to welcome you to today's event, uh, Timely Tales of Energy Codes, kickoff to the National Energy Codes Conference seminar series. Um, so to kick things off and introduce our group of esteemed panelists and presenters, I'd like to hand things off to Jeremy Williams with the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, take it away, Jeremy. All right. Thanks, Ian. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome and good morning, I suppose, to our West Coasters. Um, so as Ian mentioned, you're tuned in to the National Energy Codes Conference, uh, or NECC, what we're calling our Fall Seminar Series. We're kicking off the series today, and it's going to continue through uh, the uh, coming weeks, throughout the fall, and so now through early December. I am Jeremy Williams. I work for the Building Technologies Office at the U.S. Department of Energy. I'm going to get us started here, tell you a little bit uh, what you're in for, and then we're going to pretty quickly turn it over to today's panel. Uh, Ian, if you mind clicking us to the next slide. Okay, so here we go. Today, we have a lineup of state and local panelists. They're going to uh, talk to us a little bit about new and innovating things that are happening in their states, uh, their cities, their regions, anything from the influence of new and advanced technologies to how they're using codes to support um, pretty ambitious state and local policy goals anything from new and existing buildings to zero energy to electrification and how energy efficiency can play a role uh, in things like hazard mitigation and resilience. And so we're going to start out um, with a series of, of short talks from our panel, and then we're going to spend much of the time of today's session in discussion, uh, dis uh, and we'll have a moderated discussion amongst the panelists. Um, but as part of that discussion, we also want to hear from you. And you can weigh in in a couple different ways here. One, uh, we have a chat as part of the webinar that Ian mentioned. So as, as we're moving through the presentations and the early part of the program, be thinking about questions that you might have, comments, feedback. Don't be afraid to fire it into the chat, send it our way, and we're going to collect those comments and we'll circle back to those later on in the session. The uh, second piece is we're going to be doing some audience polling. And so from time to time, we'll throw some poll questions on the screen and we'll give you a shot uh, to respond to those. Uh, let us know what you think. And we're going to use those to help frame the discussion. Um, we're also going to use those to help um, the, the we're going to give the, the panelists a chance to respond and react uh, to the polls. So be thinking of those questions as we go. Uh, put them in the chat and then we'll circle back to those. But before we get to today's panel, um, I want to give everyone kind of a quick heads up what's to come in uh, our seminar series. So we're going to be meeting weekly, Thursdays, every Thursday at 1 p.m. We'll take a week off for things like Thanksgiving break, um, but otherwise every Thursday and 1 p.m. Eastern, I should say. And the sessions are going to take a variety of formats. And so today we have a, a, a panel discussion. Um, we'll have some other panel discussions like today. We're going to do some deeper dives on, you know, or via uh, lectures, for example. We'll do some training seminars. Um, we'll have some interactive breakout sessions, a number of different formats that kind of lend themselves to the individual topics. And so, well, it's unfortunate that we can't be together in person this year at the NECC. Uh, and it may be 2020, but I think everyone would agree this year has been anything but, but perfect vision, anything but clear. But as far as energy codes go, um, the discussion continues. And in a way, there's more happening than ever. So we want to be sure to provide a forum where we can talk about those issues, uh, answer questions, share information, and do all the things we typically do through the codes conference. 
So before we get to into the panel today, um, let's get us going um, by learning a bit more about you. So this is going to be our first set of polls, and we want to know uh, where you're from, what you do, how long you've been at it, and to do that, um, we're going to do three different questions here, one at a time. And so, Ian, if you don't mind pulling up that first question, we'll give people a chance to respond. Okay, there's the first one. So you should see a screen popping up uh, or a window popping up on your computer screen. We'll, we'll give each of these about 10, maybe 20 seconds for everybody to read the question and respond. Um, and then we'll have Ian, Ian will show us the results hopefully and uh, we can see where we stand here. So this first one, looking to uh, see which region you're located. Um, Southwest, Midwest, Western, and across the board. All right, so here are the results. Okay, so most, many of us are in the Midwest today. Most of us are in the Northeast and pretty evenly distributed in some of the other regions there. So everyone should see the results on your screen now. Uh, hopefully you can see that breakdown. And then why don't we jump to the next one? Okay, so which role here most closely aligns with your profession? And so the responses we've offered up here, they're actually based on the typical audience that we tend to see at the CODES conference, or at least what we've seen in, in recent conferences. And so we're curious to see who's joined us this year in, in this new uh, or alternative virtual format, whether we look the same or whether we look a little different than the average year. I'll give it just a couple more seconds here. So get your response in if you can. Okay. Lots of designers, architects, and engineers, a handful of trade members, builders, 15% code officials, uh, just shy of 20% uh, in the NGO or nonprofit or consulting category and uh, a solid fifth in the other category. So we'll have to figure out um, who you are in the other category. But this is, this is the breakdown um, of who's on the phone today. And then third, let's jump to our third question. Um, we typically have a pretty good mix of newcomers and seasoned experts, uh, you know, that are involved with the CODES conference or attend the CODES conference, which is a good thing. Um, it's good to kind of have a nice mix of, of different perspectives, different backgrounds, different levels of experience. Um, and so we usually get a pretty good blend of professions in geography, which, you know, helps make for a lively discussion. And so that's what you're going to see in the third question here once we get it up. There we go. Okay. Right. So years of experience. And so it looks like about a third of us, just shy of a third, are in that one to five year category. Um, almost the same number in that 30 plus year category and everybody else is kind of in the middle. So interesting. That's a uh, uh, heavy on both ends of the spectrum. But again, that's that's great for discussion purposes and hopefully we'll be able to take advantage of that today. So, okay, that's our three poll questions to start with. And uh, last we checked, I think there's about 200, 250 folks or so on the phone today. So that gives you a feel uh, for who's out there and, and who else is, is listening as part of our virtual meeting. So with that context, let's shift towards our panel. I want to start by introducing today's moderator, who is David Nemso. David is the director of the Building Technologies Office at DOE. And as part of his job, he oversees a $285 million research and development portfolio. It's focused on innovative and cost-effective energy efficiency, demand flexibility, uh, market-facing projects, and other solutions for building technologies, equipment, systems, as well as whole buildings. He was previously the director Director General, I should say, of the New South Wales, Australia Department of Energy, Utilities, and Sustainability. 
He's also a past president of the Alliance to Save Energy in Washington, D.C., and he was the chief policy officer of ICE Energy, which is, I believe, a company specializing in thermal storage systems. He has the master's from Harvard University in public policy, a bachelor from Brown in environmental policy. Most importantly, he's a great boss. He understands the impacts of energy codes, the issues that they face. And so, David, it's my pleasure to introduce you today, and I'll send it your way to get us rolling with the discussion. Well, great, thanks, Jeremy. And frankly, you could have cut out all that introduction junk until you said great boss, but it's nice to thank you for saying that. Hey, I'm having some uh, bandwidth problems here in Bethesda, Maryland, so my uh, camera doesn't want to turn on. Um, uh, I trust you can hear me okay, Jeremy? Yes? Thumbs up? All right. Okay. So uh, thank you all. Welcome on behalf of uh, the U.S. Department of Energy and the Building Technologies Office. We're, we're disappointed not to be with you in person in uh, Chicago or Denver, but um, we're delighted uh, to be with you online. And thanks for participating. And as Jeremy said, I hope you'll be able to join us uh, for the uh, next 11 sessions after today and have your calendars marked for this time on uh, most Thursdays. We have a really great panel today. Um, we're going to hear from uh, uh, code officials, code leaders from the city and county of Denver, from New York City, from the state of Oregon, uh, from the National Association of State Energy Officials, and from the International Code Council. So stay tuned for that. But first, let me give you a little bit of a word from our sponsors and tell you about what we're up to at the Department of Energy. And we're going to even ask a question of our panelists today and of our um, of you all in the audience about what we're doing and, and what we should be doing. But So stay tuned for that. We think of our job as bringing innovation to building energy codes. We're here to support you. You're the people who are doing it, who are developing and adopting and uh, um, uh, 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 encouraging compliance and enforcement with codes. We're here to support you. And we'll tell you how we do that. First, a reminder to all of us how big the stakes are, how important our job is with energy codes. Buildings consume more energy than industry, than transportation. Uh, they, uh, uh, and on electricity, that 39% of total US energy use happens in our nation's 125 million uh, residential and uh, commercial buildings, whether it's a uh, condo in a big building or a big hospital complex and everything in between. And on electricity, it's that much more. We're talking about three quarters of U.S. energy use uh, happens in the uh, building sector. And at peak times uh, in just about uh, all the country, that's even more. So there's a lot of energy consumption here. Uh, that leads to a lot of pollution. About 35% of our nation's CO2 emissions and uh, are from a building-related energy use. And that leads to a total bill of over $400 billion each year. And of course, a lot of that is wasted. I put down here, look, 20 plus percent. If you want to say 20 plus plus percent or 30 percent, I don't think I uh, would argue with you, but it's a big number and uh, part of our collective job is to get it down uh, across the building stock, especially with new construction. And a lot of the bu buildings, of course, last a long time. So uh, uh, most buildings in the US are over 20 years old. And uh, just about half of them are over 40 years old, which means they were built before the modern peri period of uh, energy considerations, including the energy code. So that's our job in, in both new and uh, uh, existing uh, buildings. Next slide, please. And so, in fact, why don't you click through on this one, Ian, for me. So I'm just going to list here um, the, uh, uh, the, some of the things we do and uh, at DOE, and um, so we, uh, we're very active participants. I want to say DOE, by the way. I just want to say I'm talking now about those like Jeremy and I who work, uh, who work in the, uh, the mothership here at, uh, in Washington, in, uh, at the department proper, but also the lab infrastructure led by the, uh, Ian and his colleagues at the uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab. So at the DOE end of the process, including the labs, we're uh, active participants in the model code process that um, the IEC, ICC's IECC and ASHRAE's 90.1. Uh, uh, our Secretary of Energy is required by statute 
that when the ICC and ASHRAE promulgate new standards every three years for each of them, uh, to make a determination whether they will uh, save energy compared to their predecessors. And we support the uh, technical analysis to allow the secretary to make such a determination. Uh, we provide, uh, the next one is very important, we provide technical analysis to you, of, you in, um, at the states and, and local government for adoption. You're our client in many ways. And we have a goal that we, we hit every year uh, by hook or by crook, but we hit every year. If you have a question for us, if you are a state or local a state agency, and we do as many local governments as we're capable of, if you have a question for us, if you want us to analyze uh, the 2018 code and say, oh, but, but do it for our climate with our, um, our new housing starts, uh, or, or new commercial starts, oh, and, and swap out the windows for this, we'll do that. And if you say to us, we want it done in KWH and KW and tons of CO2 and dollars, we'll do that. And if you say, we don't care about CO2, but we care a lot about peak, that's what we do. So that technical analysis and p &L takes the lead with us is very important. And I hope you won't be shy about asking uh, for our support for that. Uh, we're working, you'll hear a lot about the next bullet over the next, uh, over the coming 12 weeks about uh, uh, protocols and research methods to help uh, help uh, you do your job and help our broader community to understand uh, the role of codes and how energy is used in buildings and how codes can support that. Uh, we work to build partnerships and that means working with you. And you're gonna tell us, I hope, in the, today and in the coming weeks if we're not doing a good job there, but whether it's a workshop such as uh, this as part of the National Energy Codes Conference or specific workshops over the course of the year, work that we're increasingly doing internationally with uh, colleagues at the International uh, Energy Agency. We wanna build partnerships uh, with you all and to help uh, your and our own te technical development. Uh, we're developing tools, uh, typically software tools, such as ResCheck and ComCheck on the, the residential and commercial side, respectively. Uh, compliance uh, tools, uh, uh, workforce development, to help, again, help you uh, do the job you have. And then we do have, uh, uh, you know, uh, generally speaking, you all are the ones who regulate uh, building energy uh, codes in America. But when it comes to manufactured housing, that's a federal responsibility. DOE does that in conjunction with HUD. And our uh, DOE, our, my sister agency, uh, uh, the Federal Energy Management Program, promulgate standards on federal buildings themselves. But everything else um, uh, is, is, is your fair game, not our fair game. And of course, the question to you all is what else should we be doing with our resources? So we'll be asking you about that. You can keep going, Ian. I don't see the next, okay, great. Um, so I mentioned partnerships. If you're in this audience, you are a partner of ours and I hope uh, you will stay that way. Uh, but we partner with a lot of groups, everybody uh, we can, but the, the key element ones are listed here, the national labs I talked about, and not just p and but but uh, uh, based in uh, uh, um, Washington and Oregon, but also the National Renewable Energy Lab based in Colorado and the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab based in Berkeley, California, but these are national organizations, international ones with international stature. Uh, we partner, of course, with uh, the ICC, uh, who's with us today, as well as ASHRAE, other federal agencies. Uh, and, and I'm talking about now partnering on the energy codes front, but in our office, the Building Technologies Office, we conduct other non-code related energy efficiency activities and, and so we're partnering a lot with other agencies. Of course, the states, and that means uh, uh, state energy offices, but also uh, code and safety agencies. Of course, uh, local government, city and county uh, code and safety departments, you'll hear from two of uh, their representatives today. And uh, many of you, I, I'm sure, work for uh, uh, home builders or, uh, or local uh, uh, building associations, state building associations, or, um, uh, or advocates work for the regional energy offices or for other groups. And uh, we welcome uh, partnering with you all. 
and, uh, uh, and research teams to help uh, uh, look into the science of uh, building energy technologies as well as building energy code, uh, uh, big data and uh, visualization uh, research. And so um, uh, uh, we're anxious to work with you and uh, I, I hope we're doing a good job and uh, we'll look forward to doing it that with you, whether it's in cyberspace or in real life. Uh, next, please. All right, let's talk about money for a minute from my office, because money is a good thing in life. And do we have some funding opportunities on the street? Some are directly related to energy codes, some are not. But these are competitive funding arrangements that we put out, and uh, they're in different stages. The first one is more focused on research, but there is a uh, uh, topic in there on uh, workforce training that I think is, I don't think, that is directly relevant to any folks in this meeting. This is funding opportunities, what we call them in, in my parlance. It's called BENEFIT, which is a clever acronym there. This just got released last Friday, just got announced. And uh, uh, if we haven't already sent to everybody on our mailing list, we will do that. You can see the URL here, or you can just Google it. Just Google BTO and DOE and BENEFIT, you'll get that. So that's $80 million that we're putting on the street for a series of uh, uh, activities, most are on the R&D side, such as lighting and HVAC, but some of them are uh, 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 on the workforce training issues and on manufactured housing and things relevant here. So if you're interested, please apply. Uh, this can be open for uh, several weeks. Next is one that's already closed um, called Proving Ground, in which we're working with state and local partners, uh, as well as private partners, but uh, to do uh, to field validate uh, emerging technologies, working again, especially on the state and local front. That one's closed, we're evaluating that. We may do that again in the coming year, so I hope you did apply. Next one, please, is coming up. This one's called Connected Communities, and in a nutshell, it is, in, uh, uh, it, it, we think it'll be, it'll be coming out in October, we're quite sure, of this year and be open for a, a few months, a very big, ambitious uh, approach to look at how do we take uh, not just buildings, homes, and offices that are uh, smart and connected uh, uh, and, and grid flexible, but how do we do entire communities of them? And so we're looking for applicants who will take new or existing and or existing uh, buildings residential and or commercial buildings and uh, uh, develop them in a way that are connected and flexible. And uh, we'll have tens of millions of dollars for probably six to eight or nine demonstration projects. And finally, uh, another long clever acronym called EMPOWERED, which had um, uh, subtopics on, uh, again, workforce training for code officials. Uh, that's closed. Again, we're making final decisions there. So I want to let you know about that. And uh, uh, please stay tuned with us. If we can support you financially in this competitive environment, we certainly will. Um, and, and stay on our newsletter. Next, please. So finally, I want to just conclude my time. Uh, if we could do the next slide. Just these are some topics that, uh, you know, for especially for Jeremy and uh, 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 Ian and the PNL team and myself, what's on our minds at the uh, DOE end of it, uh, of building energy codes. And, and I'll let you read these for yourself, but these are some of the key uh, issues. When this panel is over today, we're gonna have more issues as we learn from our panelists and as our next, uh, uh, as the series of 12 seminars. But, uh, you know, I'll just briefly say, we wanna be able to integrate not just the traditional technologies of fenestration and HVAC lighting and um, uh, insulation, but looking at the emerging technologies that are coming out, uh, electric vehicles and photovoltaics, storage, and keeping an eye on uh, uh, the climate impacts, which are increasingly uh, part of the mix. I uh, already referenced smart and connected buildings and what that means for the code. Of course, uh, a lot of impacts of, uh, of the COVID pandemic situation, of both the social distancing element of it, and the, as well as the public health element of it, and uh, what it means for the macroeconomy in terms of uh, new housing starts, et cetera. 
a lot of focus, we'll hear about some of it today, on shifting towards whole bu building performance, not just uh, elements and what that means. Uh, we need better analysis tools and big data tools to do uh, all of the above. Uh, resilience is a particularly important issue, and, and I don't think I've told anybody here who's, uh, Blake uh, is with us from Oregon, I don't tell anybody who's from California, Oregon, or Washington, or the Gulf Coast about uh, resilience. And uh, so we want to find that nexus so that we can help promote uh, energy resilience at the same time we're promoting, en promoting energy efficiency in buildings. And of course, technology, you know, the joke on the second to last bullet is, uh, as somebody once said to me, my buildings keep getting, that my technology keeps getting newer and my buildings keep getting older. So we want to see how do we marshal that innovative technology. So those are some of the things on our minds. Let me, uh, uh, let me stop talking and let me turn to our panel, please. And then we'll have plenty of time later for questions from you in the audience. So we've got a great um, uh, panel. Uh, we're going to start today uh, with Amber Wood. Amber is Energy Program Administrator for the City and Counter County of Denver, doing a lot of exciting work. I'm going to turn to uh, Emily Hoffman, who's Director of Energy Code Compliance from uh, uh, the uh, uh, New York City Department of Buildings. Uh, turn to Blake Shalide in Oregon. He's an engineer at the uh, Department of Energy uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, the Beaver State. Ed Carley is Building Programs Director at the National Association of State Energy Officials and will bring us uh, the perspective of the SEOs. And then batting cleanup today, is Ryan Coker, who's uh, VP of Innovation, great title, Ryan, VP of Innovation at the uh, International uh, Code Council, and is a very active player in, uh, in, in codes, in code development, and in, uh, and in resilience. So with no further ado, Amber, take it away, please. Thank you very much. Um, so, I'm Amber Wood. I'm uh, with the City and County of Denver. I actually work in our Office of Climate Action, Sustainability, and Resiliency. Um, so it's essentially our climate office. And if you'll go to the first slide, um, I'm really going to start with the why. So I'm going to kind of go over, you know, what do we talk with our stakeholders about when we're talking about moving energy codes forward, and then ultimately get to our kind of some more detail about our actual work. But I do want to just acknowledge that you know, particularly now more than ever, although we have always tried to put together, you know, the, the nexus and find the nexus between equity, affordability, health, um, as, it, as it addresses buildings within Denver, that's obviously more important now than ever. Um, the basis of a lot of what we do are our climate goals, which is the next slide. And currently we have an 80 by 50 climate action plan where we're trying to get to an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. We actually also within that have a net zero energy um, goal of being net zero by 2035. And then just this year in 2020, we actually had a climate action task force that got together to look at how we can equitably move Denver forward and address climate change broadly. One of the one of the areas was buildings, of course, transportation, um, another resiliency, adaptation, and on and on. Um, they actually made a recommendation that we look at going ahead and moving forward more quickly to be more in line with climate science. So we're looking at how do we um, possibly meet being net zero for homes in 2024 and net zero for commercial buildings in 20. 27 for those code cycles. If you go to the next slide, the reason that we're addressing buildings in Denver is similar to a lot of the country, but also a lot of other cities where 63% um, of our greenhouse gas emissions are from buildings specifically, 12% um, from homes, 51% from commercial and multifamily. And if you go to the next slide, that's our, our current is 63% of our current building stock. Of course, we all have to address the fact that by, by 2050 in Denver, specifically 40% of our building stock will be new construction. And so how do we ensure that those are um, highly efficient, all electric type buildings that um, won't just continue to add to our greenhouse gas emissions? So if you go to the next slide, 
this is actually how our new construction market is broken out. So we primarily right now are building apartments and condos followed by offices and banks um, as far as the square footage. And this is the five year increase um, forecast and we're building a lot of single family homes as well. If you go to the next slide. So a piece of what we're trying to do is figure out how to tie together our climate goals within and, and what can we do in energy code. So we recently adopted um, the 2019 Denver Energy Code and the 2019 Denver Green Code, which is a stretch code based on the IGCC. Both of these are based on the 2018 um, I codes. So 2018 IECC for the Denver Energy Code and the Denver Green Code is IGCC. Um, you'll see that actually we did succeed in being more efficient than the actual base 2018 code um, 2018 IECC, and you'll see the line on there for reaching Denver's goals for commercial buildings. If you go to the next one, we've also done the analysis for residential buildings as well. And then finally, if you go to the, the final slide, is really what we're doing now. So Denver has a green buildings ordinance, which requires um, either a green roof essentially or um, solar, green on grade. It also has energy efficiency in it, um, and so there's options for new and existing buildings. So there's some energy efficiency, um, not requirements, but selections that can be made beyond code. There's also a net zero new building implementation plan that we're working on and planning to wrap up this year, um, by the end of this year. And really that implementation plan that we're working on in conjunction with, uh, so the climate of office, uh, in conjunction with community planning and development, which does all the design and permit reviews and has all of our um, building uh, code experts there, we are working together on a collaboration where we basically map out how we get to net zero within the energy code um, over the next code cycles. The big deal on this though is that we're working with stakeholders to figure out what that plan might be um, and putting a plan in place that we can essentially get to net zero. What happens with that plan ultimately is that it goes into our code adoption process. So Colorado is a home rule state. We don't have a state energy code. So Denver is very involved in their, in their own code adoption process. We are committed to, be, to have our energy codes and all of our codes based on the I codes. We then amend them um, generally to be more stringent and to help us meet our climate goals, but in a way that the community, that works for Denver. So we do a lot of stakeholder outreach and engagement to get their input on how we can make this equitable, affordable, um, how we can ensure that our buildings are healthier, particularly as COVID um, has happened and we have considerations for ventilation and all of those pieces and trying to wrap it all together. Um, and I should mention that for this net zero implementation plan as well, um, when we're talking about net zero, we're actually talking about more broadly, highly efficient buildings, all electric buildings, looking at that potential, um, renewables and grid flexibility are all addressed within this implementation plan. And we're, we're wrapping it up now and actually having stakeholders meeting, stakeholder meetings in October to look at how we, we put this as a comprehensive plan to address all of those pieces. Um, and then finally, in 2021, we will be doing a code adoption process based on the 2021 I code. So we will be doing a base code, base energy code based on the 2021 IECC. Um, and then in addition, we have a voluntary stretch code that's the Denver Green Code that we're looking to somewhat base on the IGCC, but also um, this round we are trying to get innovative ideas for other items that we might include. We've um, had discussions about whether we need to be talking about more materials or other specific pieces within the Denver Green Code, and so we may um, increase the scope of that significantly. Uh, we've also, um, as part of the IECC, our, our current code has EV requirements within it, our current IECC. Um, and we've also looked to, to other technologies that might be able to get us um, both buildings that are more efficient, but also um, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions are, are both um, extremely important, both to us and to our community. So that is what we've been working on. And with that, I am done. Thank you very much.
Uh, thanks very much, uh, Amber, for that. We appreciate that. And uh, I'm glad to see you, you keeping busy there. Let's turn to, um, let's turn east. Emily Hoffman with New York City. Hi, good afternoon or good morning, everybody, depending on where you are. Um, today, I'm going to talk about New York City's sustainability policy. Um, my name is Emily Hoffman. I'm the Director of Energy Code Compliance. Um, I work at the New York City Department of Buildings, so we regulate the building stock. We also develop the energy code. Um, we have a separate agency that works on the sustainability plan, which is what you're seeing on this slide right now. But um, in, um, in New York City, about 68% uh, of our greenhouse gas emissions come from our building stock. So the sustainability plan that is put in place uh, is greatly dependent on what happens in our buildings. So just to give you a brief history, uh, Mayor Bloomberg in 2007 created the first sustainability plan. It was called Plan YC, and it had a goal of a 30% greenhouse gas reduction by 2030. Um, then in 2014, Mayor de Blasio issued the One City Built to Last plan. Um, and in there, he upped the, uh, the goal to be 80% greenhouse gas reduction by 2050. And, uh, and also to have 40% of that reduction uh, come from a building stock by 2030. So that's a pretty big lift. Uh, to, as of, uh, I believe, two years ago, we had gotten to about 19% greenhouse gas reduction. So we still had quite a ways to go. And then uh, just last year, there was a new, if you go to the next slide, Ian, there's um, a, a new sustainability plan came out called 1NYC 2050. And this includes eight visions for a sustainable New York City. Um, it doesn't just focus on buildings. It focuses on a lot of, um, a lot of different social justice and economic plan and, you know, like a free, free public school for all, um, you know, down to age three. But I just wanted to highlight the two visions in there that affect my work at Department of Buildings. So one of them is uh, vision six, which is called a livable climate. And the goals in there state that New York City will achieve carbon neutrality. So they upped the goal from 80% by 2050 to carbon neutral by 2050. And also to have 100% of our grid be from clean electricity. So meaning that 100% of it is coming from renewables or a renewable source if they're you know, dealing with, uh, with RECs. Um, and then Vision 8, just want to touch on this, is this sort of touches on our building stock, is to have modern infrastructure. Um, and the goal is to have 20% electric vehicle share of new motor vehicle sales by 2025. So New York really wants to push that, you know, electric vehicles are, uh, you know, purchased and used in the city. But in order for that to happen, there has to be the infrastructure for chargers. If you've been to New York City, there's not a lot of space. Um, so a lot of these uh, electric vehicle chargers need to go within our buildings. So I'll touch on that in a few slides and, and what's happening. If you want to look more at the report, there's a link. These will be posted later. Um, some of the legislation that directly affects our energy codes, uh, you know, at Department of Buildings, there's a local law. It's called Local Law 32 of 2018. And this really set forth the, the policy for our energy code adoption process. So this law states that um, we must have in 2019, which just passed, and in 2022, we must follow the NYSERDA stretch code. So NYSERDA is a state authority, the New York State uh, Energy Research and Development Authority, and they have published a stretch code. In um, The publication was actually in 2020. Um, but they're working on another stretch code that we will be required to adopt by this law in 2022 or whenever the next code cycle is, it might be 2023. So that will be mandatory that New York City adopts it and you know, all new construction, any additions, alterations that will all have to follow uh, you know, the New York City Energy Code, which will require the stretch code provisions. Um, and then in 2025, the law says that we need to have an energy code that has op absolute energy limits for buildings 25,000 square feet and greater. So really no longer can we have this uh, mandatory prescriptive requirements in our code. We need to have 
The law says that we need to create an energy metric. We need to do it by occupancy, building occupancy, and you know have have research to back up why we set these limits and what they are. Now the energy limits, uh, the law leaves it open. It could be based on carbon metrics. It could be based on um, EUI. Uh, you know it, that's wide open for us to figure out what that will be. So. Um, so that's one law. And then the other law, you might have heard of this one, it's called Local Law 97 of 2019. Um, and this is a law that it, you know, so, so the energy code affects any, any, you know, construction that's happening in the city. But Local Law 97 sets a greenhouse gas limit for any building 25,000 square feet and greater. Now, these buildings may not plan on doing construction, but they still have this greenhouse gas limit. So they have to reduce their energy consumption to be under this limit, uh, starting the you know the the calendar year of 2024 to 2025. That's the first year it goes into effect, um, and then the fines will start in 2025 if buildings exceed that limit. Uh, so so there's there's a certain greenhouse gas limit in between 2025 and 2030, and in 2030 that limit will drop. So the idea is that it becomes more stringent over time, and many of these buildings are going to require deep energy retrofits to reach the new greenhouse gas limits. Um, so those are really the two policies that affect us. Um, and then, you know, the rest of my presentation, I'm going to really dive into three new code provisions that came in our 2020 code that, um, you know, we thought would be interesting to share with everybody. So our um, our 2020 energy code went into effect May 12th of 2020. Um, yes, this was during COVID. All of this happened while we were all working from home. Um, and uh, the provisions are based on, you know, we are a local jurisdiction. New York City is part of New York State. So we are required to adopt the state energy code. So we adopt the 2020 New York State energy code, which is based on the 2018 IECC and actually 90.1 2016. Um, by Local Law 32, we're also required to adopt the provisions in the NYSERDA stretch code. So we took those provisions and basically modified the state energy code to include the stretch code provisions. Um, we also are required by law to have a New York City uh, advisor, an energy code advisory committee. So we go through all the provisions that are in the code. And that committee comes up with new provisions that we feel the city should adopt. So we also have new provisions that came out of that committee that are in the code. Um, and just to point out, uh, the 2020 New York City Energy Code is for the residential provisions. It's about 19% more stringent than the 2015 IECC, so our previous energy code. And the commercial provisions are about 11% more stringent than ASHRAE 90.1 2013, or about 5% more stringent than it. Ashley 9.1 So, um, you know, we had a lot of headway on residential and somewhat on commercial. Next slide, please. So one of the first new provisions I'm going to talk about is uh, thermal bridging. We have a new requirement in the code that requires documentation of three specific types of thermal bridging. Um, this code requirement is only for documentation. It's not for, uh, you know, we're not requiring derating of wall assemblies at this point, but we felt this, you know, the code doesn't really address thermal bridging. So we wanted to make sure that we were priming the design industry to identify thermal bridges, document them on the plans, and then in a future code cycle require, uh, you know, the performance of these thermal bridging to be taken into account. So the three types of thermal bridging are clear field assemblies, uh, point source thermal bridges, and linear thermal bridges. So this documentation is now required um, in both the residential and commercial provisions, and it would be for any envelope work. So all new construction, any addition, and then any alteration that um, affects the envelope. And next slide. So I just wanted to give you uh, an idea of the type of documentation that we're looking for. So for clear field thermal bridges, we just want you know, a description of the thermal bridge assembly. Um, most of these are found in ASHRAE uh, 9.1 Appendix A. 
So, you know, a, a lot of the factors are just taken from there. So we want that documented. We want section details on each one of these thermal bridges. So we want them documented on the plans and we want a visual of the section detail. Um, for the point thermal bridges, we want all of, all of the ones that are, so for the commercial provisions, any specific thermal bridge that's greater than 12 square inches needs to be called out. So we want that, you know, area of each thermal bridge and then the number of occurrences that happens throughout the building. So for residential, that threshold is eight square inches, 12 square inches for commercial. And next slide. And then for linear thermal bridges, we actually have a list in the code. There's a table in the code that lists five specific linear thermal bridges. They're parapets, balconies, war slab edges, fenestration perimeters, and shelf angles. And we have a default psi value listed in the code. And this default psi value comes from the BC Hydro Building Thermal Envelope Bridging Guide. Um, and it's based on unmitigated thermal bridges. So we want the design applicant to list the type of thermal bridge. We want the psi value either from the code or if it's better than the code, they can uh, do a therm analysis or provide documentation on where they derive that psi value from. Then we want the total length of that thermal bridge within the entire building. So, um, you know, we want, we want that, you know, added up throughout the entire building and also looking at the section detail locations. Um, so that's the type of analysis that we want to see, not really analysis, that's the type of documentation that we want to see on the plans. So, um, you know, we've done a lot of, we've put it together a how-to guide, so we've done a lot of um, you know, documentation on this and trying to prime the industry for what that needs to look like. Next slide. Um, so that was the first provision I wanted to talk about. The second provision I want to talk about uh, affects energy modeling projects. So it's not for all projects, but just the ones that choose to follow energy modeling is the compliance path. Um, it's in the commercial provisions of the code, and it's for any new building that's 25,000 square feet and greater that chooses to follow energy modeling. Has to uh, meet, this, meet the requirements of what we're colloquially, colloquially calling the envelope backstop. So previously, if uh, energy modeling was the chosen compliance path, you could trade off without limit the envelope performance with high-performing HVAC and high-performing lighting, as long as the total annual energy cost of your design did not ex uh, was better than that of the baseline building. So now there's an additional requirement that says, you know, in addition to meeting the modeling provision, you also have to meet this envelope backstop, meaning that your uh, your envelope assembly cannot be 15% worse than code. So it can still be worse than your, uh, you know, prescriptive provisions. Um, the allowance is negative 15%, 15% worse than code for residential occupancies, like multifamily dorms, or 7% worse than for all other. Um, so, so when we go to check this during plan exam, we require all of the modeling documentation. And we, in addition to that, we also require a comm check report. And um, we've worked closely with PNNL, and uh, PNNL has been great and developed a specific comm check for the envelope backstop. So if you go to the next slide, I have an image of what that looks like. Um, you know, you can see if you look here under project information, you see the energy code called out is the 2020 New York City Energy Conservation Code, Appendix CA, which is ASHRAE, uh, envelope, modeling envelope backstop. So this comm check is specifically used to demonstrate compliance with the envelope backstop. Um, and if you go down, uh, if you look at the bottom of the green banner, you'll see that, you know, this particular envelope design is negative uh, 6%, so 6% worse than code, essentially. Um, and the allowable margin is negative 13.8. So this is a weighted average between the uh, residential and non-residential occupancies. Um, so this, you know, this is something that's required and uh, definitely new to the industry. And then the last provision I wanted to talk about was electric vehicle ready requirements. So like I said, in New York City, there's a big push for um, you know, uh, the, the sale of electric vehicles within New York. With that, we have to build the infrastructure. So actually in the building code, uh, it, Local Law 130 of 2013 
uh, require that any new construction of a parking garage or an open lot, which is in, you know, essentially the type of building that falls under our commercial provisions in the Energy Code, um, this building code requirement said that for 20% of those spaces, you had to provide electric vehicle ready, essentially level two for a level two charter. So there has to be panel capacity within the garage and conduit that can handle a level two charger. Um, and again, that's for 20% of the spaces of that garage and open lot. Um, what this didn't touch was single family homes, uh, personal garages. Um, so that was added this in our 2020 energy code for the residential provision. So now if you build a one, two family home, um, you have to provide this electric vehicle ready for each um, parking space per dwelling unit. So it's two family home, two, two parking spots are required to have this. If uh, you have a common parking lot for like a, a low rise multifamily building, only 5% of those spaces are required to have this. And the requirements are you either have to have an outlet for a level two charger, or you have to provide the panel capacity and conduit for the future installation of this charger. Um, these requirements also do if that, that uh, come into, um, you know, are triggered for alteration. So this would be when the electric capacity is increased during an alteration and there's parking, then electric vehicle ready requirements would be um, would would be triggered. And uh, with that, um, those are all the questions, all the slides I have today. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Emily, and, and thanks to the work that you and uh, New York City are doing. Uh, let's let's go west. Let's go to Oregon and hear from uh, Blake uh, Schleid, who's with the Oregon uh, Department of Energy. Blake, please. Hi. Um, hope everyone can hear me. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what has been happening in Oregon regarding energy code development and kind of the policy drivers that are, um, you know, really really leading our uh, our efforts. So uh, next slide. So um, over the past few years, our agency and our sister agency in the Building Codes Division have been, um, you know, kind of really guided by a couple of recent executive orders that were issued by our governor that, um, you know, targeted energy efficiency and greenhouse gas reduction um, in, in a number of sectors, including the, the new construction sector. So starting in 2017, um, EO 17-20, um, included three main sections for uh, for energy efficiency. Um, the first one was leadership in state buildings um, and just making sure that we are operating our own buildings as efficiently as we can um, and setting targets and conducting audits and um, and just tracking our energy in a, in a way that helps us to manage that and reduce our, our consumption. Um, the second element of that executive order really targeted for building codes um, reductions, um, primarily on the, res on the residential side, looking at equivalency to the USDOE zero energy ready home um, standard and then on the commercial side exceeding the ASHRAE and the IACC model codes. Um, it also set provisions for solar ready and EV ready um, elements to be factored in and included in the codes in, in future cycles too. Um, and it also um, asked our agency to start looking at opportunities for appliance standards. Um, and I've got a little bit more about that in, in our presentation um, today too um, and how those complement building codes. And then the third element of this executive order was around existing buildings and, and affordable housing um, and, and developing a kind of a 10-year plan to maximize efficiency in, in that space and in low-income and affordable housing space. Um, next slide. And most recently, kind of right before the, the pandemic hit in, in a, you know, early March of this year, our governor issued the uh, executive order 20-04, which targeted a number of state agencies um, with specific greenhouse gas uh, emissions reduction directives. And our agency and the building codes division in our state had a couple very specific targets to kind of continue on from the, the policy directives that were issued in the previous executive order and kind of carry those forward all the way till 2030. And the goals that were laid out in, in this executive order were a, are a 60% reduction of new building annual site energy consumption, um, you know, only for code regulated items, so excluding transportation and, and plug loads by 2030, comparing that to a 2006 baseline. Um, so kind of continuing on to put to what was already a pretty aggressive energy efficiency uh, goal for our new buildings and, and new construction. Um, this executive order also um, 
had a directive to refocus on the reach code. Oregon's had a reach code um, for a while, but um, you know we're a statewide code state, um, not a home rule state. So you know what we have at the state level is mandatory, and um, we've had a reach code, but there's been just some challenges in um, in, in adoption and kind of in incentivization to get um, local jurisdictions and get projects to actually use the reach code. So this executive order kind of included a couple elements to uh, to spur additional reach code development and, and outreach um, so that we see more uptake with it. Um, and then it also directed our agency to work on 10 specific uh, appliance standards, energy, energy efficiency standards for, for equipment, um, which is really, we see it as very complementary work to, to our building codes efforts. You know, as building codes become more and more efficient, a larger percentage of a building's load will go toward what's plugged in and what's used. So we see kind of that as the, you know, the next frontier, the next step um, for achieving net zero energy buildings um, to end, and to reduce the overall energy load of a, of a space. So um, I think it's really important to have these kind of high level policy drivers so like executive orders and like uh, Amber and Emily were talking about with some of their local policy drivers too, um, to really give agencies the, the ability and the authority um, and the motivation and direction to get, get, to get to these goals. So that's what those, these executive orders have really done for us. Um, so on the commercial on the commercial side, um, Oregon is really moving toward a quick adoption of 90.1. Um, we see it as kind of the the most advanced of the of the model codes. It uh, you know 90.1 and ICC tend to kind of mirror each other, but we see that 90.1 is uh, you know kind of comes out a little bit earlier. Um, about two it kind of leads the the ICC process by about by about two years. So um, you know the quicker that we can adopt. A more efficient code the more buildings get included in that in that code so we adopted ASHRAE 9.1 2016 um, in October of last year and actually coming up later this month um, the plan is for our commercial code energy board to start the process for considering adoption of 90.1 2019 um, and we see a number of advantages to moving toward um, you know a, a mostly wholesale adoption of, of ASHRAE um, you know one it's it's very well supported um, we can kind of lean on and, and build upon the expertise that goes into the development um, of the ASHRAE codes and all the committees and the cost effectiveness analysis and the technical analysis that goes into it. Um, you know, it's really well supported by the USDOE and its determinations um, and, and ComCheck development. In the past, we've had kind of a homegrown code that, that took uh, a lot of resources at the state level to, um, to manage and to, um, to kind of manage the process for new code proposals and adoption and then uh, developing the compliance software and a custom com check for, for Oregon, but kind of moving toward 90.1 um, really streamlines that, that whole process and, and um, reduces resources and adds some efficiency into, into our code development process. But we've also uh, layered on an element um, that includes and requires an incorporation of the architecture 2030 framework for estimating the consumption of, of what's the building going to use for its energy and it, it leans on the the architecture 2030 zero code calculator um, and so with every you know every permit and every code submittal there's a requirement to you know not only submit the com check for code compliance but to also submit the oregon zero energy ready code form um, that estimates the building's energy consumption um, estimate asks for an estimation of how much renewables could be installed on the building um, and what might needed to be uh, to offset in order to achieve net zero energy consumption. We're not at the point where we're requiring any on-site um, on renewables, but this, this step kind of adds to the, the awareness um, in the design and, and building community for you know, what, what's the gap between now and, uh, and a net zero building. So uh, next slide. Uh, so kind of speaking back to some of our goals for a 60% reduction versus the 2006 baseline, this slide demonstrates our, our progress. So right now we're on the ASHRAE 9.1 2016, um, which represents 64% uh, um, of where we were in 2006. So that's a 36% reduction. Um, we think that as soon as we're able to adopt 9.1 uh, 2019, we'll be at 55% of where we were, um, so about a 45% reduction. Um, on our way toward that 60% uh, reduction goal in, in 2030. So, um, you know, the ability, so ASHRAE overall has been kind of on a glide path to, to help us get to those goals over, uh, you know, over the past few cycles. Um, we kind of expect a similar trend, but, um, you know, you never know how some of those 
code developments could go. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll have to look at where we are over our next two or three code cycles to make sure that we're continuing that same glide path to, to where we want to be in 2030. So, next slide. So just a couple other kind of final items to, to close it out and some of the other things that we've been working on that aren't necessarily directly related to the energy code but are related but are kind of uh, you know associated with it. Um, we as, a, as an agency have developed a, a voluntary home energy scoring program um, across our state that we've now seen some local jurisdictions starting to to pick up and adopt and make and make mandatory most uh, you know, the, the biggest uh, example of that in, in Oregon is the city of Portland, who a couple of years ago adopted a mandatory home energy scoring requirement. Um, so when, whenever a home is sold and, and there's a transfer there, it needs to have a home energy score um, that's that's developed and and associated and um, kind of made made apparent to the to the buyers so that folks can know what they're um, you know, what they can expect in terms of efficiency for their for their home. And that's both for new construction and existing homes. Um, and then appliance standards are, are another element that I mentioned before that we really see as very complementary. So we're in about halfway through our appliance standards development process now with our current round. Um, we've done our rulemaking to adopt 11 new standards in, in Oregon to, to really align with the standards that um, California has and that Washington recently adopted too. So to kind of create a, an aligned and harmonized West Coast set of standards. And we really see that as as important um, element to complement our building codes work. And then I also just wanted to mention too, you know, we've had a a really um, heavy fire season out out west, and it's really impacted, you know, a lot of a lot of our state, um, a lot of California and Washington too. And I just wanted to mention that a couple of years ago we did adopt what's known as the Wildland Urban Interface Code for wildfire hazard mitigation. That um, you know I mentioned before that we're not a home rule state, but this is actually one element of our code where we we have adopted an optional appendix to um, to our statewide code that local jurisdictions can adopt um, if they if they choose to that provides some additional wildfire hazard mitigation um, construction requirements to, to hopefully protect against some of these some of these fires and and some of the destruction and devastation that we've seen on on homes and area and buildings in our communities so and with that, that's all of my slides. So thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks, Blake. Look, you know, Blake, you just used the term glide path for your previous slide. Mm -hmm. Something tells me there was no gliding involved, that you were working it like a galley slaves, but I I uh, <laughs> appreciate the uh, the progress there. I want to say before I introduce, uh, uh, and, and Blake, you give us a lot to think about. Before we turn to Ed, uh, just a reminder to everybody, please use the uh, question function. I might have said chat function in the um, in the GoToWebinar, but it's I understand it appears as the uh, question function. Uh, we're collecting your questions, and, and we will be asking them shortly, but not before we hear from uh, Ed Carley with, the, uh, with NASIO. Ed. Hey, thank you, David. Um, so I'm going to speak without slides today, but um, first I, I do want to thank the Department of Energy for hosting this event. Um, the Energy Code Conference is always a great chance to catch up with code experts and um, get everybody together. So I'm glad we have a forum this year, even if it's all virtual. So yeah, and, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Ed. We can't all do it at the bar afterwards. I just want to put that on the uh, record for the for the meeting. Hopefully next year, right? Yep, yep. And hopefully back in uh, Chicago. We were supposed to be at the Palmer House in Chicago, a great hotel and in a great city. So, all right, sorry, Ed, back to you. I, I was looking forward to taking a stroll down the, um, what is it, the, the Million Dollar Mile. It's beautiful architecture there. But, um, so yeah, this has been an eventful year for codes. Um, there's lots of activity around the 2021 code. There have been energy code field study results published from a variety of states, especially in the Northwest. Um, there's lots of conversation in states and jurisdictions across the country considering EV codes. More and more places are considering existing building performance standards. Um, St. Louis adopted one this year on top of um, New York City, which just spoke about it, uh, Washington, D.C., and the state of Washington. Um, you know, layered on top of all that activity are climate change concerns, which has brought a lot of attention to building codes and the role they can play in reducing emissions. So um, 
David and Jeremy and Ian and the PNNL team asked me to kind of speak about the, the broad trends that NASIO has seen across the country uh, from our members and, um, and, and just sort of give a sense of what's going on. So we've seen this year that a number of states that have not updated their code and sometimes have, have moved up to 2015 or the 2018 codes. Um, but at the same time, there have been delays to effective dates and codes due to COVID. Um, places like Massachusetts and um, Connecticut have had significant delays. Uh, I think Washington State also delayed the adoption of their code. Um, play, some places have gone forward with adopting new codes. For example, Maine, Delaware, the District of Columbia, St. Louis, Kansas City, New Mexico, and the city of Albuquerque within New Mexico um, all adopted this year. Other places like Virginia, Arkansas, Connecticut, Montana are considering adoption, or they were before prior to the pandemic, but um, you know, obviously that has thrown everything up in the air. Some places like Arkansas had a full-time virtual um, meeting format prior to the pandemic, so they were able to just kind of push along smoothly, but that's a, a process that is, is largely stakeholder driven and will have to be approved by the Arkansas State Legislature. So what happens there is sort of still to be determined. Um, let's see. So in addition to considering adoption, there are a lot of states like we've heard um, today that are considering either developing or adopting stretch codes. Some of those states are responding to state legislative mandates. Some are responding to governor's executive orders. In a lot of cases, um, you know, these are members of things like the U.S. Climate Alliance that are, are really looking at how codes can play a role in achieving their goals. Um, we've seen Maine and Connecticut are, are two good examples of this, but there are others. Um, and as Blake noted, we've seen a lot of states that are considering how appliance standards can contribute to efficiency. Uh, more of this action we saw happened last year rather than this year, but you know things could always change. Um, but it, there was kind of a flurry of activity around that in 2019. Uh, Hawaii, Colorado, for example, were two states that adopted appliance standards. In addition to Oregon, I believe Nevada also adopted some new standards. Um, in many places, zero energy codes are being discussed, mostly as stretch codes so far, but often with targets for a net zero base code in the 2030 timeframe, um, give or take a couple of years there. Uh, I believe Oregon is still the most aggressive target, so way to go, Blake, but, um, and good luck. Uh, let's see. We're also seeing some states are adopting the 2018 code and have specifically noted that they intend to incorporate some of the 2021 language. Um, either immediately or over the next year or so. We kind of heard that today. Um, the EV ready language is, is what's most commonly cited. I've heard this from Western states and um, from Western and Midwestern cities. Northeastern states and cities are, are other examples of places where they're considering this. Uh, but it's not just, it's not just Northeast and um, and west, we've also seen this in Florida in some places. Uh, Atlanta, Georgia is a commonly cited example down in the southeast. So there's broad interest, um, and it's it's not just in kind of the places that are um, the leading edge on code adoption. So something to keep an eye on and make note of. Um, with all that said, there are still a lot of states and jurisdictions that are using the 2009 or 2012 code. Uh, as we look at the the current landscape, I think if there's anything that's going to push states and jurisdictions that are on the 09 or 12 off of that, it's likely to be the Federal Emergency Management Agency's Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, or BRIC program. Um, BRIC proposals are going to be led by state emergency management agencies, but as the part of the evaluation um, rubric that FEMA is using, there's a 20 point category for adopting one of the two most recent codes. I was on a webinar uh, or listened in on a webinar recording that ICC hosted with FEMA a couple weeks ago. And um, at this time, it doesn't look like FEMA is going to penalize states or jurisdictions that have amended codes, but it sounded like that might be an option in the future. Um, 
to be determined, obviously, that that program is still in its first year and still uh, only accepting its first round of, um, of proposals. So um, BRIC is, is really a huge opportunity for building officials to increase awareness of the importance of building codes and unlock a significant amount of funding for their offices. Um, like I said, the lead agencies are the state emergency management agencies. NASIO has been strongly encouraging our state energy office and territory energy office members to get engaged on the topic because it's really important and um, potentially a lot of money on the line. Uh, that notice of funding opportunity or NOFO is available on the FEMA website now and the application period is open into January 21 and January of 2021. So wanted to flag that for folks. It, it's definitely something that should be on your radar if it is not already, um, especially if you work for a jurisdiction of some sort. Um, shifting gears a little bit, I'd like to note that um, NASU is available for our state and territory energy office members to offer technical assistance. Um, if you have any questions about energy codes, we're happy to answer those or provide um, research support, connect you with other states that have um, handled similar questions. Um, we've also worked with a number of states now to conduct energy code field studies that can be used to help get a sense of how buildings are being constructed in a state and um, measure any remaining savings potential available with whatever code is in place. Um, we've partnered with DOE and Pacific Northwest National Lab on those. Um, thank you to DOE for the support and PNNL for all the help. Um, that's a really useful tool for states to, to use and for jurisdictions to use to get a sense of what's going on in their communities and how buildings are being constructed. There's a lot of data that comes out of those and I, I, I can't um, state strongly enough how useful those are and encourage you to, to um, pursue those just to get a sense of what, what's happening and how buildings are being constructed and if there are energy savings being left on the table. Um, so we've I've run three for NASIO and there have been um, studies completed in a number of states across the country, and most of those are available on PNNL's website. I think the four Northwestern states have all now been published um, this year, but there's also a number from a cohort of field studies that happened starting back in 2013. Um, I'm happy to share my experience with how to make that work and go smoothly. Uh, there are a lot of things that come up along the way, and um, we've gained a lot of experience with running those. So in addition to those technical assistance aspects. Um, we've been tracking the spread of virtual audits. Uh, this is something I personally am excited about because I, I think it can help to um, solve some of the workforce challenges that building officials and um, building offices are facing. You know, the lack of qualified talent. Um, I spoke recently with someone from a, a jurisdiction in Nevada who told me that they had been trying to hire a code official back in November and the before times, uh, they got 29 applicants, three of them were qualified, and all of the three that were qualified were out of state. Now they have had so much success with their virtual inspections, and they're only using them for a limited number of types of inspections. Um, they have opened up a position for a full-time, full virtual inspector. So that person can be located at anywhere in the U.S. They'd obviously prefer located in Nevada, but um, they'll hire somebody from wherever and bring in, you know, a new qualified code of inspector who can do some of these inspections. Um, obviously, there are some concerns around access to high-speed internet, um, whether that's, you know, wired or wireless, but or cellular internet. Um, there are some challenges there for the rural areas, but I think that there's also a strong opportunity for rural areas where maybe they haven't um, had qualified code officials or there's so much windshield time involved in code inspections that it limits their ability. Uh, I think that there's, there's really good opportunities there. Um, so uh, I think it can also do a lot to speed up construction um, like I said, by reducing that windshield time between job sites, 
there's some safety elements that um, that that individual out in Nevada noted. I, I think that a region or a neighboring jurisdiction had had an inspector fall off a ladder. And you know, if, if you're doing a, an inspection with a drone or um, with somebody else who's working the camera, if it's a, a PV installation, for example, um, one of the folks who does the the PV installs is probably more co comfortable on a roof than a building official who has to do all different kinds of stuff and maybe isn't always climbing climbing on roofs every day. Um, let's see. So finally, the year has, of course, drawn a lot of focus to the 2021 IECC development process. Um, I, I don't think it's an understatement to say it's been contentious. Um, there have been a little more than 20 code change proposals that were challenged by a variety of industry groups and a series, series of hearings have been held by the International Code Council to determine which proposals will or will not be included in the Energy Code. Um, I've been monitoring the appeals process closely for NASIO. Uh, we've been working to preserve the ability of all of our members um, to continue to participate in that process in an effective and inclusive way. Uh, I don't want to go too deep into that. Um, there's a lot going on with it. It's very complicated, but I'm, I'm happy to share additional information on the 2021 cycle if any of the participants are interested. But, um, you know, th like I said, there's a lot going on there. and uh, our main concern is ensuring that that our state energy office members and territory energy office members continue to have a voice in that process. Um, they see it as an important part of their authority as states to help set the, the regulations and building codes of their own states, uh, even if they are home rule states. So with that, I will wrap it up. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Great. Thanks a lot, Ed. And um... Uh, thanks for that uh, overview of, of uh, state and local activities around the country. I want to say on that issue of remote and virtual uh, inspections and diagnostics, uh, we couldn't agree with you more, DOE. I personally think that's one of those uh, areas. We're not going, I don't think we're going back to the old normal on that. That was happening anyway. And um, uh, when we're past COVID, uh, I think, I think, it's a one-way street and we're gonna have a very different new normal. It is, you might have noticed the topic of one of our upcoming um, uh, sessions in this series, November 5, and we'll be doing a deeper dive into that. And we're also uh, at my office, the Building Technologies office at our annual peer review coming up in November, doing a uh, discussion and it's been internationally discussed. So there's a lot there and um, uh, uh, I appreciate Nazio's work on it. Um, we're going to turn to Ryan Coker. Ryan is a uh, VP of uh, Innovation at the ICC and uh, active, very active in these issues. And uh, Ryan, uh, take it away. We wouldn't be having a, a model code to uh, to work on if it weren't for the ICC. So tell us, tell us what you guys are up to. Yeah, thanks so much, David, and uh, definitely appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, certainly thanks to the uh, previous panelists who really laid out some of the things that are going on uh, at the state and local issue, uh, state and local level. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, sort of how it's, some of those things culminate uh, at a national level and then some of the other things that uh, we're working on at ICC to really move um, energy codes, resilience, uh, and, and really create, uh, you know, better communities and better buildings. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, most folks are actually probably familiar with the Code Council because of our uh, model code development process, but I think it's really important to understand that there are a variety of other activities that fall under the Code Council, which really support uh, implementation uh, in communities in a, in a whole wide variety of different ways. And so, you know, certainly training uh, and certification is, is key, uh, but also looking at things like product evaluation and making sure that um, the products that are specified uh, you know, meet the code requirements, uh, working with communities on really understanding their resilience and providing benchmarking tools uh, to help them move forward. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, through my work with the Alliance for National and Community Resilience. Um, but I think it's really important to sort of understand that, that bigger picture. Uh, and so you can go to the next slide. Uh, it was really great to hear um, from the pri prior panelists on uh, there are various different commitments to uh, greenhouse gas emission goals or zero energy building goals or, you know, various different strategies 
uh, to improve their building stock. Uh, I think one of the challenges that we've seen uh, in some areas is that the connection between sort of those broader uh, community-wide goals and the application of energy codes is actually just not there. Um, they haven't necessarily sort of made that connection. Uh, and so I think that's really an important point to think about. Um, you know, uh, in the table there, uh, you see some analysis done by NBI to look at the various different uh, types of commitments uh, and, and sort of the extent of, uh, you know, how uh, state and local governments have committed, uh, you know, to these various different goals. Uh, but at the same time, as Ed mentioned, you know, we have uh, some of those states and some of those communities actually on a 2009-2012 uh, energy code. And so there's sort of that disconnect there. And so I think that's really an opportunity um, to, to bring, you know, those goals uh, and, and impacts of buildings uh, together. And so it's really sort of an impetus uh, to think about you know, sort of where your energy code uh, currently sits. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so one of, I think, the important tools uh, that we've been thinking about uh, and real opportunities to help move the discussion forward is this intersection of energy codes and resilience. Um, you know, I, I think previously we've seen a lot of work um, within the energy code community, uh, separate work within the resilience community, uh, really looking at, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, improving communities. And so how do we bring these two uh, sort of potentially disparate uh, activities uh, together to help really move communities uh, together, uh, you know, into a common uh, goal uh, and really looking across various different policies and practices uh, that can support their work. Uh, and so we were looking at the intersection of various different codes uh, and resilience. And so we developed a white paper uh, specifically on the intersection of energy, energy codes uh, and resilience uh, and how they really contribute and work together uh, to improve communities. And so, you know, thinking about some of the things that are within uh, the energy code, uh, like durability, uh, moisture management, uh, extreme weather protection, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute, uh, and really the coordination with other codes uh, really, you know, sort of expands that dialogue beyond just uh, kilowatts or greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but really further uh, illuminates community benefits uh, through the adoption of building codes. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so I'm going to touch on sort of two aspects of that resilience uh, message, uh, one uh, sort of physical and one uh, sort of social. Uh, but, you know, when we think about uh, opportunities to address uh, extreme heat or cold events or, uh, you know, power outages that happen uh, after some other uh, disaster event, uh, the concept of passive survivability, really that, you know, you can stay in your home uh, longer um, because it's more comfortable, um, you don't put pressure on community shelters. Uh, and so, you know, design decisions that are made, uh, you know, relative to uh, insulation, uh, windows, uh, and those sorts of things can really contribute to uh, passive survivability. And so, you know, how can we think about opportunities uh, that we have today within codes and moving forward into the future uh, to really have that coordinated approach that um, when we do talk about things like insulation and windows, uh, we're not just talking about uh, energy use, we're also talking about the contributions uh, to passive survivability. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. And then, uh, you know, thinking about uh, on, on the, the social side of uh, energy and resilience, uh, we think about, you know, not just sort of the infrastructure systems or emergency response, but sort of the day-to-day -day, uh, impacts of uh, you know, stresses on communities. Uh, and particularly for uh, low-income households, uh, energy is certainly a, a significant amount of uh, their uh, monthly cost. Uh, and so, you know, being able to uh, keep folks in their homes, uh, reduce their stress of, you know, do I uh, pay the electricity bill this month or do I provide uh, food for my kids? Um, can I afford to, you know, turn on the furnace? Uh, those sorts of questions. And so there's certainly been um, some great analysis uh, out of ACEEE uh, just over the past couple of weeks of, you know, looking at, uh, you know, how energy burdens uh, impact, you know, various different uh, constituencies. And so, you know, they looked at uh, low-income households uh, as a whole. Uh, they also looked at, you know, various different communities, uh, African-American communities, uh, Native American communities, Hispanic communities, uh, older Americans. Uh, and, you know, in most of these uh, different demographic groups, um, they all experience higher uh, energy burdens 
uh, than the than the uh, you know median uh, American household. And so you know that's sort of another benefit that we can identify you know through the application of building codes uh, and energy codes in particular is you know reducing that energy burden uh, and reducing those stresses. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. I mentioned the Alliance for National and Community Resilience, uh, which I think is really important to sort of build out the conversation uh, when we talk about resilience. Uh, so Anchor has identified 19 different community functions that really you know, make communities great places to be, uh, but it also influences their resilience. And so um, you know, it's thinking about the social, organizational, and infrastructural aspects of communities and sort of the intersection uh, and the interplay between you know, all of those particular functional areas. Uh, and so it really provides uh, that big picture of uh, you know, what sorts of activities are going on. Uh, I think Emily you know, certainly talked uh, about the you know, broader plans uh, within New York City and sort of the intersection of uh, you know, various different departments uh, to really help the, these things move forward. And so really sort of understanding you know, how these pieces work together uh, and having uh, you know, a common set of uh, benchmarks to really start from, uh, I think is really essential. So you can move forward to the next slide. Uh, we can't talk about uh, resilience these days uh, without talking about uh, uh, COVID uh, and how you know, various different folks are uh, responding uh, to the challenges that COVID provides. Uh, so we've actually been doing a series of surveys of code officials and code departments. Uh, our first survey was actually conducted uh, in April uh, really, you know, the, the sort of first wave of response uh, to COVID, uh, we asked code departments, you know, how are they responding? Uh, you know, what are they doing to continue to provide uh, public safety? Uh, and, and, you know, sort of how are they adapting? Uh, and so uh, we actually reconducted uh, that survey uh, just a few, a few weeks ago uh, and, and are really looking at, um, you know, sort of how code departments have evolved uh, to address those particular challenges. Um, so many of them are you know, continuing to perform inspections, uh, but we asked them specifically about uh, remote work, electronic work. Um, you know, we, we actually see that in, in some departments, uh, code officials have gone back uh, you know, to their offices, uh, but I think the real uh, sort of things that we've seen, and, and David actually just touched on this, uh, about moving to electronic uh, and remote processes you know, whether that's permitting, uh, plan review, uh, or inspection. Uh, as you see here, you know, we've seen uh, some increased uptake in electronic capabilities, uh, which is certainly, you know, a positive uh, and something that I think we'll, we'll definitely see uh, moving forward. You can go to the next slide. Uh, sort of based off of, you know, what we've heard from uh, code officials uh, about their particular challenges, uh, we've actually developed a few documents to help support them to move towards uh, more electronic uh, practices. Uh, so the two documents on the right are uh, sort of recommendations or considerations for uh, remote plan review uh, and permitting uh, and remote inspection. And then we actually uh, just recently put out a document on recommended practices uh, for remote virtual inspections. Uh, it's actually available as a free PDF uh, for anyone who's interested uh, and taking a look at that, uh, but really, you know, providing tools for code departments that recognize uh, they need to to change uh, and need to be able to uh, work uh, and and uh, inspect uh, virtually. Uh, and so, this document certainly, uh, you know, helps uh, move down that pathway. I would certainly recommend folks to take a look at that. Um, I will say that uh, you know these documents, uh, the results from the survey are available from uh, the Code Council's uh, Coronavirus Resource Center, uh, which you can get to from uh, the Code Council's uh, homepage. Uh, it's just iccsafe.org. Uh, a whole bunch of other resources there as well uh, around building reopening uh, and those sorts of things. Uh, so would certainly recommend uh, taking a look at those. Uh, you can move to the next slide. Uh, and then I just wanted to touch on a, a couple additional uh, forthcoming resources from the Code Council uh, that hopefully you know provides a sense of you know some of the things that we're talking about, uh, we're thinking about uh, what our members are asking for, uh, and so we're actually working on an adoption and implementation toolkit uh, specifically around uh, energy codes, uh, stretch codes, uh, and really how to support communities in achieving zero energy uh, and low carbon buildings. Uh, so that should be available uh, within the next few months. 
Uh, we're also uh, heavily involved in offsite construction standards um, and the offsite construction industry in general. Uh, I know I didn't talk a lot about it here, um, but we certainly see it as a significant opportunity uh, you know, for uh, the building industry uh, to address many of our different challenges. Uh, and so uh, you know, there is some work at NREL uh, specifically on this topic, uh, but we will be uh, launching a standard on uh, MEP systems, energy efficiency and water conservation and offsite construction. Um, we certainly have activities through the International Green Construction Code. Uh, and then um, you know, the 2021 uh, international codes uh, are uh, you know, due out um, within the next couple months. And so we'd certainly encourage folks uh, to take a look at those uh, as well. Uh, so hopefully I've provided a good uh, sort of preview for uh, some of the upcoming sessions um, in, the, in this series, uh, but really laying out the things that are going on uh, within the Code Council and really helping to support our members and the, the broader industry in uh, you know, achieving their energy conservation goals. Uh, so really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, you absolutely have, Ryan, and there's your contact. Um, thanks for that. You're going to get some questions about that. So we're going to do uh, one quick polling question for the audience, and then we're going to turn to questions for our panel. So Ian, send up uh, the polling question, please. Oh, this is a tough one. So if folks could respond to that. And uh, again, please submit your own questions through the uh, question function. Uh, we're collecting those, and we have a couple of our own, and we're going to turn to those. We'll give it about uh, five more seconds, so get your okay. uh, votes Thank in you. there. Okay, closing poll. Hmm. Good, that gives us something to think about. Bunch of challenges there, huh? Big distribution. Net zero is in first, closely followed. Look at that performance and compliance. All right, why don't we uh, ask the panelists to turn your um, cameras back on, please, and unmute yourselves. And then, um, good. I'm gonna start and then and then we'll turn to an audience question. Look, I think we heard all, I know we heard a lot today from you all about uh, things that you're doing, things that I think are different than you might've been doing two or three or um, uh, five years ago. Uh, whether it's technology like uh, uh, Emily was talking about or focus on EVs or net zero like uh, uh, Blake and Amber were talking about. So let me ask you this. Let me tie that to a question about workforce. How, how comfortable are you? Nervous or are you comfortable that your own workforce, I'm not talking about particularly the construction workforce, uh, are ready for these new technologies and new approaches is that is that uh, something to be worried about, or do you, you feel good that you're moving forward with your people as as the co energy code situation changes? So that's a question to all of you, but I'd really like to hear, especially from uh, Emily and Amber, who are who are in the tr uh, forefront. Uh, sure, I'll go first. Um, well, I've you know I've been at the buildings department for seven years now, and we we are on our fourth code update since. In those seven years, so we have uh, we're used to training our staff on new code updates, and we've made a lot of progress. We've gone from the 2011, um, or I guess it was the 2009 IECC, to the 2018 and beyond. So um, you know we we're kind of in a rhythm now of uh, you know creating new training materials and you know figuring out where we need to go and getting a you know, like we know in 2025, we're gonna have a performance-based code. So we're kind of prepping everyone that this is coming and, um, you know, trying to feel out on our own staff and uh, where where uh, the deficiencies are, where we need more training and then reaching out to, um, you know, different organizations, DOE, PNNL, NYSERDA, to kind of help us fill those gaps if we don't have the expertise on staff. 
Gotcha. Amber, other panelists, any reactions? Yeah, I'd add to that. So I'd say that similar to Emily, we have we have really good training right now. I would say our bigger issue, um, which has been impacted by COVID, is simply that we need more um, inspectors and reviewers. Um, so we just right now we have a limitation of staff numbers, and we just we just need some more people to assist with the load of work um, that we currently have. And so training definitely is a consideration and we do um, use both internal and external resources. We've, um, we are looking for some additional pieces to the training itself, but I would say our, our bigger challenge is just needing some additional staff. Gotcha. So and before others respond to that, I just have to ask because um, we do have two women here. Look, this is a traditionally male-dominated field, and I mean both building energy codes and construction and retrofit. Any any reflections on being a, a, a leading women in a traditionally male-dominated field that you'd like to share? Um, or sorry, we and we only have half an hour, so. Just, uh, <laughs> I'll be quick. Um, and you know, I um, I have a degree in engineering. Throughout engineering school, women were the minority. I think we had a lot of women in our class, and it was 25%. But I was found actually in the sustainability industry within the construction workforce in New York City. Um, it's about 50/50. Um, our own team is about 50% women. We have a lot of women in leadership, and then even in our buildings department, we have our first woman commissioner. So things are things are changing. So it, it doesn't feel like we're at a disadvantage. <laughs> yeah, I would just uh, piggyback on that. Actually, the, the director of both community planning and development and the director of our office, the Climate Action, Sustainability and Resiliency are both women. Um, and I would just continue on that and say, you know, I think a lot of it is, I, I am an engineer as well. We had about 25% women in school. Um, and I think it's a combination of, you know, it's important for anybody to find their mentors and you have to find people that you admire, um, both from from all aspects of life, I think that's important. Um, and I think a lot of people are continuing to address the other side of it, which is, you know, structurally, how can we encourage all sorts of people um, in industries that are not they're not currently in? And I think that's an important side. I think personally, it's great to see um, more women, more people of color, more, you know, there, there have been a lot of changes um, and I hope to continue to see those changes. So I, I would say both sides of that, right? We want to continue to change and see that change. Um, and I think then personally finding, finding mentors is, is really important and people that support Thanks. you. So. Thanks, Amber. Look, on that latter point about diversity, in my office, I personally, we care a lot about a diverse workforce. And we don't do it just because we're members of society. We do it because our job is so hard, right? Helping the US trim that energy loss. If we don't get all the talent we can, regardless of their background, with the diversity of uh, personal background or educational background, right? We're not, our job's hard enough without excluding uh, anybody and not being inclusive. But let's not, any, anything else from uh, uh, Blake or Ed or Ryan about uh, workforce training in general and especially as, as codes become more aggressive and evolve? Yeah, I can, I can certainly talk a little bit about that from uh, the perspective of code officials. Um, you know, we, we actually did a study uh, or a survey uh, a few years back at the code official workforce and, you know, no surprise to anyone, um, you know, it's an aging uh, pre predominantly, you know, white male uh, profession. And so, you know, I think there's some real opportunities there as we talk about, you know, new technologies or moving beyond just, um, you know, the, the role of the code official as, uh, you know, a public safety officer, but thinking about some of the strategies around, um, you know, resilience and, and the impacts on communities and sort of broadening that vision that you're not just, you know, a code official to, you know, to work specifically on you know saving kilowatt hours you're actually impacting you know a broader community and making communities great places to be and so you know sort of leveraging new technologies remote virtual inspections uh, and the like and sort of the, the equity uh, impacts of energy codes i think we can uh, really broaden that perspective to to get new folks interested in in the kinds of work that we do gotcha uh 
Uh, unless you have thoughts, I'd like to turn to Jeremy Williams, who uh, is fielding uh, questions from our audience. Jeremy, what if, what if folks want to ask our panel? Sure. Hey there. So we have a lot of questions pouring in from the audience now. So that that's great. Keep keep uh, putting those in the questions panel there as you think of them. Um, some chatter uh, comments. So Anna noted that the city of Chicago has updated their code based on the IECC recently. So that's great. Um, some additional comments about uh, workforce challenges. And, and actually, why don't we start there with a the question? So Roxana asked, what specific changes are driving the need for workforce energy, or excuse me, education and training programs? And that's really for any of the panelists who wanna jump in on that one. So, I mean, I can, I can certainly start. I mean, you know, um, all of our panelists talked about, you know, various different new technologies or new processes you know, that they're looking on and in, incorporating, you know, within their building codes, um, you know, certainly things like um, energy storage, uh, you know, EV, uh, you know, tying to buildings, um, you know, all of those various different things. And, you know, code officials, uh, you know, sort of look at, you know, all of these various different, you know, pieces of technology. And, you know, if they're not uh, familiar with it or need to do, you know, additional research, um, you know, that can slow the, you know, the permitting uh, and plan review process. And so, you know, having, uh, you know, code officials that are familiar, uh, you know, with all of these various different technologies uh, is certainly beneficial. And, you know, kudos to, to DOE on the Empowered program. I think that will be a huge opportunity uh, to get, uh, you know, code officials up to speed on, on many of these different things. Okay, good. Um, and, and then just to build on that real quick, Ryan, there's a little bit of commentary about shortages of skilled labor, which is you know, a pretty recognizable widespread problem across the construction industry. Um, Ryan, you mentioned the technological aspects, you know, dealing with new technologies. And one thing to add from the DOE perspective is our field studies sort of also shed light on this question. They're focused on a number of key items, not just technologies, but the practices that surround them, installation, uh, quality of installation in particular tend to be a big deal and in those studies which were state by state you know we tend to see a lot of the same issues show up in terms of training opportunities and they tend to be related to duct tightness and envelope tightness which you know not coincidentally are, are some of the bigger more recent changes in, in the model codes too and so some good information there um, we'll pivot to one more question maybe from the audience uh, Amber, we'll head your way. So this is from Colin, and Colin mentioned, or I should say Amber, you mentioned that the Denver code incorporates EVs. And the question here is, does Denver require actual EV charging stations or readiness? And so do they have to be what is often referred to as capable or what is often referred to as ready? So right now within our energy code, our current energy code, um, we have three levels. We have EV ready, EV capable, and EV, um, an actual charger installed. And we have basically a table within our IECC depending on um, building type. Uh, so, you know, for our buildings, we, um, it, there's different requirements. So, there are multiple levels. It, it is dependent on the parking spaces provided for the project. So if there's just a single parking space, we're asking that that's EV ready. So EV ready in our vernacular just means that there's panel space um, and conduit. And then EV capable in our definition is panel space um, and then actual wiring to the parking space and then um, and then EV installed, obviously, is that it's in, that the charger is installed. Gotcha. Okay. That's an overlapping, but a little different regime than New York City has. It sounds like in terms of the uh, mm -hmm. yeah. the levels you showed, Emily. Right. Uh -huh. Let me, Jeremy. Before we go on, let me let me ask this because we let let me be uh, maybe controversial. And I'm going to start with uh, Ed and Blake and then turn to Amber and Emily and Ryan. Uh, Ed and, and, and Blake, you represent states here. And what we're hearing are local governments who are doing their own thing. And uh, whether they're home rule or not, they're doing their own thing. And, uh, and they might be next to local governments not doing their own thing or sticking with the state level code. So as state representatives, Blake and Ed, 
are you troubled? Any reactions to uh, local governments doing uh, doing their own thing? And don't worry, you'll get a chance to rebut just a moment. Uh, uh, Blake, Grant, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I know that I'll say, you know, every state's different with regards of their structure and what they can do. Um, you know, in, in Oregon, we have, you know, the a law that says that we're, you know, essentially a statewide code, and that certainly provides some stability and uniformity for builders and folks across the state, you know, they know that they can go to Portland or Bend or Eugene and have the same the same energy code, the same building code. Um, but, you know, I think that there are certainly benefits to you know, local jurisdictions that have separate climate plans, or separate goals, um, you know, to be able to to move in a, in a different direction or maybe a little bit faster and more aggressively than than um, jurisdictions that don't. You know, every city is, is different. Um, and, you know, in the states that have that flexibility, I certainly think that there's an advantage and a benefit to, to doing that. So, I um, mean, like I mentioned before, like we have some ability in, in Oregon, like the, the wildland urban interface code, not an energy code, but, you know, the ability for local jurisdictions to adopt um, some elements of the code that are, that are different. Um, and we are looking toward a, uh, you know, toward a reach code that would be more meaningful for a local jurisdiction to adopt, maybe not as mandatory, but to be able to adopt that and then incentivize it either through like uh, you know more streamlined permits or you know different allowances um, you know incentivized through local utility programs to get a more widespread adoption of that of that reach code even if it's not a mandatory code at the, at so the local. does that mean Blake we I know you haven't decided that you would have a single Oregon um, model of reach code and then an individual local government could choose to adopt that is that what you're thinking um, yeah or even to adopt it, um, they could it, it could have incentives behind it to really increase it, uh, increase gotcha. use. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Ed, any reactions? Um, I, don't I'm worry, gonna, you're only speaking on behalf of all 50 states and seven territories, but please six, don't be six, intimidated. Six territories. Uh, I, I'm going to hedge a little bit. Uh, you know, every state is different, every city is different, and the the needs and desires of their um, their citizens are, are all different. Um, you know, you can have very successful um, energy codes and, and states that allow for local individual stretch codes. Um, I mean, California is the biggest example. They use Title 24, and states can develop their own stretch codes, or excuse me, cities can develop their own stretch. Um, then you've got New York, where I think New York City is the only city that's allowed to kind of um, develop a stretch code that is not exactly the New York State stretch code. Um, you've also got programs like the the Green Communities Program in Massachusetts that are, are a great example of a statewide stretch code. Um, but then you have communities, you know, states like New Mexico, where um, states can either adopt the statewide code, or excuse me, cities can adopt the statewide code. You can tell I'm used to talking about states. Um, cities can adopt the statewide code, or they can develop a more stringent code if that's what they want. Um, you have states like Colorado that have um, a home rule, uh, have home rule, but have set sort of a baseline where I believe it's if a community has adopted an, a building code at all, it's got to adopt one of the last three published codes. Um, it really depends on context and what works for, for that community. Um, speaking for myself, I think if I were trying to enforce or um, build in a state, I think I'd prefer to have one statewide stretch code, but um, yeah, it really it depends on what works for, for your community. Okay. Well, uh, sorry, Brian, before we turn to the local governments, does ICC or, or you personally have a view on the issue of uh, local governments adopting their own codes? Energy codes? Um, <laughs> I'm going to dodge a little bit like Ed. Uh, but, you know, we, we provide model codes to be able to work in a variety of different situations and, you know, states and localities, um, you know, operate differently. Um, you know, sort of as a, a blanket statement, we'd encourage folks to be on, you know, the latest edition of uh, the code, um, sort of, you know, whether it's a state or a locality, um, but, you know, 
the, the actual application, uh, you know, certainly varies. Yep. All right. So Amber and Emily and right, Amber, do you get Jefferson County saying to you, what are you guys doing? You're confusing everything. Or do they say how brilliant? Anyhow, I'm not trying to name names. Just well, let me give us a response from, from your perspective, please. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I think there's two pieces. I think, you know, interestingly, the home rule does kind of a fascinating thing of allowing Denver to or or any other jurisdiction to really figure out what's important to them and move that forward in a meaningful way. So it is kind of a question of, you know, obviously we need we need base code for health and safety, but then as we proceed to some of these more complex issues, the flexibility within choosing how you kind of move forward, I think is actually extremely important is my point of view. Now, of course, you I am at the city level, so of course that's probably important to me. But I do agree that having a basis is important, but I also think that as we start to look at some of these more complicated issues as we get into some of the climate type issues beyond just energy, um, being able to address those in different ways that are meaningful and, and can have stakeholder feedback. I mean, that that's honestly, it comes back to us for stakeholder feedback, like incorporating the community in moving these things forward has been very critical for us to actually do anything with them. Um, and so being able to really say, you know, here's the here's the national energy code, but what do we as Denver push forward given our climate zone, given our current where we're at, has been extremely helpful for us. So Emily. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little deeper, not on the policy level as much, but obviously I think, you know, Local jurisdictions should have their own, which is kind of the local jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, the one of the issues that we are going to be running up into is, um, you know, a lot of the tools that are used by the industry are developed onto the national model codes, like RegCheck and ComCheck. Um, and so we're going to be coming into this issue in 2025 when we have a performance-based code. What tool do we use? How do we get, you know, we can't just have a code where it's not easy to implement. So that's something on our minds too. It's, you know, we want to make sure that the national model codes are also moving where we need it to go so that we have all of these resources for implementation and training and, and things like that. Yeah, and I'm so personally building off of building off of what, what Emily just said, I mean that really um, sort of points to the importance of having state and local governments involved in the code development process as it moves forward. And so not being sort of a bystander of whatever comes out of the process, but assuring that you know, the model codes are sort of the basis for supporting, you know, whatever's going on at the state and local level. Yeah, definitely. And I do ho hope we'll have a chance to talk about performance based codes. But hey, Jeremy, back to you. What, what do we hear from the audience? Yeah, so we have a handful of additional questions here. Um, one is sort of, uh, let's pivot back to goals for a second, I would say. Um, and Emily, I, I think this question is headed your way probably, but this is from Robert. And Robert asks, as utilities add solar and wind into their generation mix uh, plus nuclear, will those additions impact your New York City reductions goals? And so do you factor in the percentage of non-carbon producing sources into your GHG goals? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so kind of at the policy level in New York, the overall policy is that, you know, the way that we're framing everything is that um, the grid is, on, is going to be going towards 100% renewable. That's a city goal. It's a statewide goal as well. So they're going to be doing solar and, uh, and wind. Um, but we're not there yet, and we're not going to be there in the next five years or 10 years. Um, so, you know, on the building level, we have to, you know, build these buildings to be electric ready, electrification ready. So that's kind of a goal on the, on the building code side. As far as um, the local law 97, where we have the greenhouse gas emission caps, uh, those have specific GHG uh, factors in there based on the current grid. But there is a mechanism in the law that those have to be updated in, I can't remember the specific time frame, but between now and 2050, those have to be updated to align with how the grid will look like in the future. So I hope that answers the question. Gotcha. I think it, I think it does. Um, and there's a related question. So on the topic, now pivoting to the topic of buildings and grid 
integration, there's a related topic that's asking about the role of codes in enabling that two-way communication between buildings in the grid. And that's so that's for anybody who wants to weigh in or David, uh, being the DOE is pretty active in this area, uh, feel free to sprinkle on some thoughts of our own possibly too. I'll just jump in and say it's tough um, to, you know, we've, there's been discussion, I think, and then they sort of stretch code. There's like an option for, um, you know, these uh, a sort of grid interactive, um, how the building interacts with the grid, but at a, at a code official level, we feel like we have no enforcement over that. So it's, uh, you know, kind of this, we know we have to get there, but how do we get the code to move that way? and it's, in an enforceable manner is um, where we we're getting held up in New York. Sorry, Blake. Oh no, that was, that was great. Thanks. Um, so I'll just add that not not necessarily building code related, but um, I mentioned appliance standards in in my part of the presentation. And one of the standards that we are putting into effect now is a demand response water heater standard that would require a, a communications port um, to allow for a utility to be able to connect to that water heater and use it in a demand response uh, way to be able to balance grid needs if there's some sort of a, a capacity issue during high demand periods. So um, you know, that's one way that, that some states are, are looking to, to tackle or at least start to address that, that question. We're similarly looking at these, uh, at, at that, and putting it in our implementation plan, both um, equipment that is interactive as Blake was talking about, and then also looking at storage. Um, energy storage and what that might look like um, in future code cycles. Yeah, this is it. So I think the um, I think the way we're going to start to see that come into codes is like Blake, Blake said and, and Amber alluded to through appliance standards. Um, I, I think that there are a lot of states and state-owned buildings that are probably going to start to be used as, as test beds for these technologies. Um, part of that was just um, through the, the DOE funding announcement that David talked about. But, um, you know, it's, it's certainly going to be a question over the next few years, and it's it's complicated um, to do. So keep an eye on appliance standards is kind of the first first way to get in, and then we'll see where technology is as the, the um, cycles, code cycles progress. Jeremy, looking back, uh, you, you're going to cover a little bit about our program and what's to come. So why don't you cover that? And if you can fit in more questions, great. But you, why don't you land the plane? Okay, sure. Let, let's do that. Thank, thanks, everybody, for wrapping up the panel here. Um, I just have a couple slides. Uh, and Ian, since you're at the helm, let's skip all the way down to what's next, which is slide 41, I think, in the or at least in the version I'm looking at right there. Okay, good. And and you can go ahead and hit next one more time for me. All right. And so just real quickly, lots of people have had questions about what's going on with the in-person event, uh, in-person codes conference. And so hopefully since you made your way here today, you've seen the, uh, the email that went out, our announcement that went out last week. And um, and what that said is that we're tentatively rescheduled for May 11th through 13th, 2021, this coming May, at the Palmer House Hilton, uh, still in Chicago. But it, that's very tentative at this point, obviously, just with everything that's going on with in-person gatherings right now and, and uh, waiting to see how that's going to unfold. So feel free to pencil it into your calendar, but definitely keep an eye um, in the coming months, coming weeks on energycodes.gov, the URL that uh, is on the screen there, um, is where you'll see those updates. Uh, jump to the next one. Okay, uh, and more on what's to come. So we touched on this briefly early on, but we kind of glazed past, past it. I want to just mention um, that the entire, the remainder of the lineup is coming up um, 
in the next uh, 12 weeks through early December, every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern. And on the screen there, you have kind of a basic listing of some of the other topics we've, we've settled on. So I mentioned earlier on, there's, there's more to talk about than ever at this point. This is what we've narrowed it down to for the purposes of uh, the individual seminars and sessions here. So it's everything David mentioned, uh, remote and virtual inspections, as did some of the panelists. That starts um, beginning next week with electronic permitting, um, which is largely a, a prerequisite to a lot of those processes. Um, and then later on 11.5, we'll have another one that uh, goes more directly at remote and virtual inspection processes. That's hosted by uh, ICC. Um, we'll also have uh, sessions on things like performance-based compliance, some new tools that DOE, PNNL, and others have been working on to help uh, local building departments, local jurisdictions demonstrate compliance with performance-based codes, which is, of course, a challenge, is um, recognizing uh, the shift towards performance-based codes, which we saw is, is one of the most, if not the most popular response in one of our polls. Um, a lot of times what you hear at the, the uh, local level is, you know, the challenge that the building department faces in verifying compliance with performance-based code. So we're working on some tools to, to hopefully help out with that. We have some of our updates, um, typical updates. Those will be deeper dives, training-oriented seminars on the 2021 IECC, separate sessions on commercial and residential. Um, we've got a similar session uh, in early mid November on uh, the new ASHRAE standard 90.1. That's the 2019 edition. We have policies for efficiency and resilience. Uh, Ed mentioned uh, FEMA's BRIC program that will be featured as, as uh, part of that particular session. We have field study updates from the Pacific Northwest up in Blake's neck of the woods. We have a lot going on. Um, so anyways, you can go, if you want more detail on these, we have lo much longer descriptions, uh, session leads, the specific speakers are all posted on energycodes.gov, the URL on the screen there. You can go check those out right now, uh, and you can also register uh, for those um, sessions that are coming up here. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so finally to close this out, I want to give a big thanks to everybody who's been, uh, everybody who's contributed to the NECC seminar series, getting us to this point, getting us planned and on, and on the calendar, um, but also uh, who are going to be helping lead these sessions um, between now and, and the rest of the fall here. So top of that list is you all at PNNL, uh, Rose, Marie, Bartlett, and Ian Blanding. You all have been instrumental in helping us get this series organized. Um, PNNL is always instrumental in helping us with the NECC and, and uh, getting um, our lineup and everything pulled together. Uh, ICC, Ryan, you all, uh, Michelle Britt, um, thanks for everything you guys are doing with um, not only leading the virtual inspections discussion, but all the work that you've done, um, you know, behind the scenes, uh, pulling together guidance and, and all the content we're going to uh, get to cover and, and share there. So thanks for that. Ed, you all at NASIO, uh, uh, shout out to the RIOs, the Regional Energy Efficiency Organizations, which is MIA, NEEP, SIA, SPEAR, uh, and SWEEP, um, who are also leading a number of the sections coming up. And of course, all of our presenters, speakers, discussion panelists, uh, the session leaders, and um, of course, all of the participants as well. So that is it. Um, I want to say thanks again for everybody for swinging by today, uh, especially to stick, uh, stick with us here till the end and, and actually a couple minutes past. We have more to share. We were a little ambitious with the amount of content we had at the tail end today. So we'll make sure to work that into another session so we don't miss out there. Um, we do hope you'll pencil us in every Thursday from here on out. Um, make sure to swing by energycodes.gov for the additional detail on the sessions and registration. While you're there, check out some of the other resources, um, whether it's the technical analysis or the compliance tools that David mentioned, that whole list of things that David mentioned earlier. And then keep an eye on your inbox for more updates on the in-person version of the NECC in the coming months. So that'll do it for today. Uh, David, did you have anything you wanted, wanted to tack on before we end here? I just want to add my own thanks to Ryan, Emily, Ed, Amber, uh, Blake for a great panel, very informative, and uh, we'll see you next Thursday. Yeah, thanks everybody. We'll see you soon.
This has been the National Energy Codes Conference Seminar Series, hosted by the U.S. Department of Energy. Join us each week for a number of other important topics in building energy codes, just like today's. We're here every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. Eastern. Participate live in our upcoming events or listen to past events on demand through our energycodes.gov training portal. There you'll find other helpful tools and resources from education and training materials to compliance tools like our ResCheck and ComCheck software to the latest on state code updates to analysis of energy code impacts from energy savings to cost effectiveness and more. Check out energycodes.gov for those and a number of other technical assistance resources from DOE, Pacific Northwest National Lab, and others. From the DOE Building Energy Codes program, we hope you learned something new about energy codes and enjoyed today's session. Thanks for being part of the conversation, and we'll see you next time.